Welcome to the Canoga Park Youth Art Center's new series, Art Appreciation, where each class we will look at a group of artists or an individual artist. We'll learn more about that artist and the art that they made. Today is my favorite subject, architecture. Architecture is the art of designing buildings, either for public use or private homes. So today we're going to be looking at six well-known architects. We're also going to be looking at six different styles, very distinct styles of architecture. Now I come from a family of home builders. My dad built homes and my grandpa built homes as well. So I have a special place in my heart for architecture. I think you're going to like looking at, we're going, looking at the drawings or the photographs we're going to see of different architects. Let's see what we have. Our first architect, his name is Le Corbusier, Corbusier, but there's a L-E in front of it, like Le Corbusier. He's a French architect, and he's referred to as the pioneer of modernism. Look at how simple that, that structure is. It's a house, and I know that today we see a lot of houses that kind of look like that, but when this was made, it was very, very unusual. Now, he... Uh, he was also very concerned with urban planning, but he was criticized for not being sensitive to cultural sites, social expression, and, and equity. He also had some controversial friends and political views. His dad enameled watches, and his mom played piano. He was raised in the mountains and wanted to be a painter. He's also self-taught. Now, we're gonna find out that a lot of these architects actually made paintings and wanted to do visual arts as well. Our next artist is Antonio Gaudi. Now, he's a Spanish architect. He was, most of his work is in Barcelona. Now, look at the difference between those two buildings. Now, our friend Antonio Gaudi, he was really in love with nature and religion. Those really governed a lot of his aesthetic choices. His dad was a coppersmith. Now, his, he was always in poor health. He became a vegetarian to try to battle some of his, uh, the problems he had with his health. He, when he graduated from college, the professors said, we have either graduated a fool or a genius. Only time will tell. He does really ornamental. You can see this is, there's color and, and shape everywhere. In fact, we get the word gaudy from Antonio Gaudi because his buildings were every bell and whistle. Uh, let's see, he um, really treasured imagination, geometry, and nature. Now, if we move down to Frank Gehry, his building is very different. This is the Royal Disney Music Hall, and he fashioned it after a blooming rose. That was his inspiration for this. He's an American architect, but he was born in Canada. And some have referred to him as one of the most important architects of all time, but not everyone really agrees with that. His parents were Russian and Polish Jewish immigrants. He's kind of started off using corrugated metal. In fact, he really liked to play. Some of his early structures used tr like common everyday materials, wire mesh and corrugated metal to make his structures out of. His father would take him to the hardware store where, when he was a kid and he got a lot of his inspiration by walking around uh, those the old hardware stores. One thing that he didn't calculate though, and one of the criticisms, is that sometimes his buildings are so shiny that the buildings around them start to heat up. So he has often had to go back into his buildings and change the texture because it was affecting the buildings around him. Probably something he didn't plan for. Now we're gonna go up to this one here. This is by the architect uh, Hunter Wasser. Now he is Australia, Austria born, but he also has dual citizenship in New Zealand. Now, a un little known fact about uh, Mr. Hunter Wasser is that he created the composting toilet. Now, a composting toilet doesn't need water to flush, so it's very environmentally 
much more friendly than all the gallons that we use to flush water. And I, I describe it as kind of like a litter box for people. He was definitely an environmentalist. And he started off being a painter. He painted these bright colored flowers. That was kind of what he was known for. He had a strong dislike for straight lines. In fact, he was once known to buy a lot and put a building on it just because he did not want another square building going there. You can see by his architecture that we've got things that are leaning over. He does a lot of dome things too, but one thing that he always tries to incorporate are plants. He'll either have plants on the roof, plants in balconies. Sometimes he even makes underground homes where he builds up a hill, he puts the home inside the hill. So he has very strong environmental, environmental concerns. And he's fun. He's used bright tiles. His buildings look like Dr. Seuss. They're very fun and unique. Now contrast that with our next artist, architect and artist actually as well. Her name, it's a woman too, and this field does not have a lot of women in it. Her name is Zahad Hadid. She is a British Iraqi architect. She was born in Baghdad and she loves mathematics. She was an abstract painter and she's been given the nickname of Queen of the Curve. One of the buildings that we have in Los Angeles, the Broad, was designed by her. Now she wrote a number of papers on how challenging it was to be a woman working in what was largely a man's world. Her dad was active in politics and her mom was a painter. It has been said of her that she bends materials to her will rather than the other way around. So she'll design a structure and she'll figure out a way to make the math and the materials bend to her will. Our last architect that we're going to look at today is Frank Lloyd Wright. This is his, probably his most famous private residence called the Falling Water House. My mom actually did a tour of this house. It looks beautiful in the winter time too. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright is famous for using materials that were native. So if there's stone around where the house is going to go, he's going to use that stone. He uses strong vertical lines. It's so important to him that the house not look like it was stuck on the land, but grew from the land. He, doesn't, he, he wants it to be harmonious with the land. Now in this house, the river actually runs through the house. Now we have a building here at the Barnstall Art Center called the Hollyhock House. And that house also has like a river running through it. It runs all the way around it and then it comes into the house and goes in front of the fireplace where there's a little bridge that goes over it so you can stack more logs on the fire. So Frank Lloyd Wright made many, many buildings. He also designed the Guggenheim, but he never got to see it finished. That's that building. It's a museum in New York that looks like a top. It's small at the bottom, and as it gets up toward the top, it gets, it gets bigger and bigger. Very distinct building. So those are the six architects we're going to look at, but let's look at some architectural styles. Now, this magnificent Queen Anne Victorian, I have a special place in my heart for Victorian houses. The craftsmanship that was required for the detail of these homes are, are wonderful. They were popular in the 1700s. Um, they were usually referred to as manor houses. They're elegant. But, simply, but, make, but constructed simply by local builders. They also always have these contrasting colors. They're painted with many, many colors. Most houses that you see maybe have one color and then the door is a different color. But on Victorians, all the trim is painted in different colors. They're characterized by corner towers and broad porches. They also have deep entrance, entrance ways. And sometimes those porches, porches even wrap around. They also feature fine brickwork. Our next house that we're going to be looking at is a plantation house. It's also called an antebellum, and that means before the Civil War. They are characterized by huge pillars, a balcony that usually is on the top and on the bottom. Sometimes they have both, a top balcony and a, a porch in the front. They have large symmetrical windows 
and a big center entrance and inside they normally have big sweeping staircases. Just think of Gone with the Wind. It's kind of like a Gone with the Wind house. You'll find them typically in the deep south, wherever there were plantations. Now, our next home is very different than that. This is a standard ranch home, and it's a quintessential American style of architecture. It was inspired by the ranches of the West. They typically are long, and they stay close to the ground. They have a, when, when after the war, World War II, people started making like track homes. Uh, a, car, a contractor would buy a large plot of land and put many homes there and they were easy to afford and they all kind of looked a little alike. These were partially, many of those homes and those early track homes were ranch style houses. Now we're going to go to a style called Greek Revival. And if you see this triangle here, that is the part that makes it a Greek revival. And look at those columns. Do you see those Corinthian, they call those Corinthian tops on the columns, the real fancy tops. Now, it was inspired by Greek temples. Uh, and they also usually use this type of architecture for institutions like banks and courts and you know civic buildings. Um, it was a practical house, uh, there was an article written, a book written actually called The Practical House Carpenter in the year 1830. And as a result of that book, many of the homes in New York and Connecticut ended up looking like this because it was a very popular book. And that book just happened to teach you how to build a Greek revival home. So now as a result, we see them all over in the Northeast. Now our next style of architecture is called Tudor. Tudor was first started in medieval architecture in England and Wales in the 1500s. Now they call this thing half timbering, where you can see the exposed beams that are running vertical. That was kind of like a style that they, they showed the construction, like an external frame of exposed timbers. Now the windows, first of all, they often stacked their windows on top of each other. And I know that seems normal to us now, but that wasn't necessarily the case back way back when these were being built. And they also have leaded windows. Now I know you know about stained glass windows, but there was a time when all windows were made like stained glass windows, only they only used clear glass. So you can see plenty of examples of this type of architecture in Los Angeles as well. Now our next, our next home is going to be Craftsman House. Now this we find in Los Angeles a lot, in particular in Pasadena, and there's older parts of downtown LA that have this style home. They're small to medium California homes that are also known as bungalows. They are characterized by deep eaves. That means the eaves stick out really, really far. They have decorative beams that usually go fat on the bottom and get a little skinnier at the top and they're supporting a porch. They almost always have front porches. They, are, they use handcrafted stone and woodwork. Perhaps you've seen one of these homes in your neighborhood because they have a lot of them around. Those are our basic styles of architecture and three or six really well-known architects. I hope you learned a little bit about architecture and I hope you get excited about it because it's a really great career to consider. And I wanted to be an architect, but I was never any good at math. But now they've got computers that do all of that. So if you want to be an architect, you can just do the fun part and draw it and have somebody else how to figure out how to make it a real building. Well, I hope I've inspired you to consider architecture as a career. And thank you for joining us for the Canoga Park Youth Arts Center's Art Appreciation.